Okay, so we were in the chapter on diagonalization, and we were finishing up the section on the, the more facts about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay. So we were here. Okay. If v1, v2 to vk are eigenvectors of A that correspond to, k, correspond to k distinct eigenvalues of A, then the set v1 to vk is linearly independent. Okay, so there's nothing here, by the way, that says that A is k by k matrix, right? So this, can, this theorem can work for matrices. You know, when you have k eigenvectors with, that are correspond to k distinct eigenvalues, but, you know, there are some eigenvalues that are maybe the same or whatever, you know, this can be a subset. This can be a subset of the eigenvectors. That's fine. Um, Anyway, then this, this set is linearly independent. Okay. So basically, if you have eigenvectors and their eigenvalues are different, then, those ve then the, these vectors are independent from each other. Okay, so now we have a proof of this. Okay, consider the case k equals 2. I, we have only two eigenvectors, v1 and v2, with distinct eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2. Again, I think the matrix itself could have other eigenvectors and eigenvalues, but we're just considering now the sets, just the set we have in k, we're just considering just those two eigenvectors v1 and v2 with eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2, and we know that lambda 1 is like lambda 2. So we want, to, we want to try and show that these v1 and v2 are linearly independent, right? So of course you look at this equation, the linear combination of v1 and v2 equal to 0. You want to try and show that alpha is equal to 0 and beta is equal to 0, that only the trivial solution of this exists. So apply A to both sides, apparently. Um, now, there's a step uh, omitted in here. If you have a times alpha v1 plus beta v2, right, then that's because a is a, well, there may be two steps we can put in here, actually. So one thing is that a as a linear transformation or as a matrix, it's, it's linear, it respects, it respects, um, or preserves um, uh, vector addition, okay, so, so that left-hand side becomes that, okay. And then it's linear, so it respects or preserves um, scalar multiplication of vectors. So you can bring out the alpha in each case. Oh, sorry, the alpha in that case, and here's a beta, it's a beta in the second case. Okay, and now you know that alpha v1, because v1 is an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue lambda, you can re replace a v1 as actually equal to lambda v1. And, oh, not lambda, sorry, these eigenvectors are different. So it's lambda 1, v1, and a, v2 is equal to lambda 2, v2. Okay, um, which gets us to here. Okay, and on the right-hand side, we just have a times, a times 0 is 0. Okay, now we have, so we have this equation. Now it says, multiply that first equation, that one, by lambda 1, and then subtract that equation from it. So the, multiply the first equation by lambda 1, okay, you get this. I mean, you can swap the order of the lambda 1 and the a alpha and the lambda 1 and the beta. And you subtract the second equation. So the difference between these two equations is the first one has lambda 1 in each case. The second one has lambda 1, but then lambda 2. You subtract them, you're going to get... Here, on the, and on the right-hand side, you have a 0 and 0. So you have lambda 1 times 0 minus 0. So you have 0 minus 0 is 0. Left-hand side, the alpha lambda 1 terms cancel out, but the beta terms don't cancel out because one of them has lambda 1, the other has lambda 2, so you get this, okay? Now, lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is not equal to 0. We know that because the eigenvalue is distinct. Eigenvectors are, by definition, non-zero. All eigenvectors are non-zero, right? Okay? So that's not 0, so the only way this is possible is if beta equals 0, okay? Now, but if beta equals 0, then you sub that into, say, this equation, and you get alpha v1 equals 0, which means that alpha must equal 0. So we've shown that if you have this equation, this linear combination, then alpha and beta, the scalars, are both 0, so the set is thus linearly independent. Okay. Now it says do k3 in a similar manner. Okay. So you have linear combination. Now you multiply both sides by a and rearrange a bit to get this. Then you can... What? 
you probably multiply one of them by lambda 3 and then subtract. Let's just do that. So you have lambda 3 times that first equation will give you alpha lambda 3 v1 plus beta lambda 3 v2 plus gamma lambda, sorry, not, v, not lambda 2 there. I'm multiplying this first equation by lambda 3, so it's lambda 3 occurs in each one. Okay, so that's, that's that equation. Multiply it by lambda 3. Now I subtract that equation. We subtract from that equation. We subtract this equation. We get, then we're going to get alpha lambda 3 minus lambda 1, yes. Alpha beta lambda 3 minus the lambda 2, and then the other, the gamma lambda 3, term that cancels out with this gamma lambda 3 term, okay? So yeah, so we get this, that's cool. Okay, uh, now it says relabel alpha lambda 3 minus lambda 1 as this alpha with a tilde on it, and beta lambda 3 lambda 2 as beta with a tilde on it. And we have, now we're looking at the linear combination of those two things equals 0. That's that, that's that. Okay, but now you can just apply the same reasoning this is just now and exactly in this case. So you can do the same thing you did in that case to this. What did you do? You applied A to this, got this, multiplied that by lambda 1, subtracted this from that, got this. Right, right. You can, and you're gonna, so you can do that with this. Okay. And you're going to end up saying that alpha with a hat on it, alpha, til, alpha tilde equals 0 and beta tilde equals 0. But... If alpha tilde equals zero, well, alpha alpha is, sorry, we have alpha tilde equals alpha times lambda three minus lambda one. Now, if this is zero, right, uh, that's not zero, so alpha must be zero. Similarly, if beta tilde is zero, is zero, then beta itself is zero. And if those two, if alpha and beta are both zero, then gamma is zero. So, the set v1, v2, v3 is independent. Okay, for k equals 4, you can do this same kind of thing to reduce the k equals 4 case to the k equals 3 case. So you do the same thing, you end up with alpha tilde v1 plus beta tilde v2 plus gamma tilde v3. But you solve, we solved the v3 case already, so then you know that they are the alpha tilde and the beta tilde and the gamma tilde are all 0 by the k3 case, and then the k3 case then reduces to the k2 case. Cool. Okay, so... In general, for any k, you can reduce it, you'll be able to reduce it to the k minus 1 case, to the k minus 2 case, and so on. So this is like an inductive proof, basically. This thing is true for all k by induction. Okay. And I think we have one last fact, yes. If an n, oh, so what, what is this all showing? This is showing that if you have eigenvectors with distinct eigenvalues, they're linearly independent, even if there's many of them. Even if you like, you have 10, eigen, 10 distinct eigenvalues, and for each of them, one eigenvector, those are distinct, those are independent. Okay. If an n by n matrix has n distinct eigenvalues, then there is a basis for Rn consisting of eigenvectors of A. Okay. So, this needs, I think, a bit of explanation. So, I think we have to put in n distinct real eigenvalues. Because remember, we're thinking, we're, we're thinking, well, you can have complex eigenvalues. So we know that an n by n matrix will have n complex eigenvalues, possibly some repeated. Now imagine we don't have that. Imagine we have n distinct eigenvalues and all of them are real. Then there is a basis for Rn consisting of eigenvectors of A. Okay? This is a corollary of the previous fact. Well, bec because if you have, you have, so you have your n distinct eigenvalues, lambda 1 to lambda n, and then each of them has an eigenvector corresponding to it, right? We know that each of them must have at least one eigenvector corresponding to it. Okay, then this proof we did here proves shows that each of those, this whole set is linearly independent, right? So we have an, a linearly independent set of n vectors, so that'll form a basis for Rn, right? Okay, the reason I put this 
little thing saying real in here is because if these eigenvalues were complex, then the eigenvectors, I believe, could be complex. Let me just check that. So if you have complex eigenvectors, you can have... Yes, yes. Because, for example, so I think the sort of a classic example is a rotation matrix, which you, you, haven't looked at, you haven't seen them yet, but a rotation matrix is something like... Never mind. A rotation matrix, whatever, it doesn't have... A rotation matrix, right? It takes a vector... So a rotation matrix in R2, for example, takes a vector and rotates it, right, to be like that. Now, so far as real numbers go, this, ma this rotation matrix takes V to AV, which is like rotated by an angle. When you rotate something, you're never going to have something pointing in the same direction, right? I mean, unless your rotation is a trivial rotation of zero degrees, but suppose you have a rotation matrix which isn't rotating zero degrees, and also isn't rotating 180 degrees, so a rotation matrix that's not trivial like that, rotating some angle other than zero or pi, such a rotation matrix is not going to have any real eigenvectors or real eigenvalues. But it actually does have complex eigenvalues, eigenvectors, uh, which is a bit counterintuitive, but you know, if we're no longer thinking about being in R, R2, but we're thinking about being in C2, right? Now, basically, the complex numbers can achieve the rotation themselves. Basically, I, I mean, I think, the way I think of it is that they can achieve the rotation themselves because you know, of course, that when you have the complex plane, right? So C2 is not the complex plane, right? C2 is like two copies of the complex plane. So it's a four-dimensional space, if, you, if you're thinking about it as real things. But if you have the complex plane, you think of it as looking like R2, okay? Then when you multiply complex numbers by each other, that does the rotation, right? So... Right? So it's possible to get, for a rotation matrix, complex eigenvectors with complex eigenvalues. Okay. But since the eigenvalues are complex, the eigenvectors are complex, right? Um, you have like AV equals lambda V, but that's complex. Okay. So this is also complex. I mean, if it was real, if it was real, if this was real, and this was real, the same one was real, yeah, this is a real matrix, so you now have a real, you have a real number equals a complex number, right? Which is not the case, which can't be the case. So the eigenvectors must be complex. Okay, so you can, t so if you have, yes, so, okay, so it can be the case that if you have complex eigenvalues, you have complex eigenvectors. And then those complex eigenvectors will not, of course, will not be a basis for Rn because Rn does not have complex numbers in it. It's just real numbers. So that's why I put this little thing saying n, dis n distinct real eigenvalues. I still want to consider the complex eigenvalues in general because they make it much, they make a, you know, they're needed for other things where you need to remember that every matrix has and possibly repeated complex eigenvalues, but in this case, we'll, we're, just, we're only interested in the, in the number of, in the real eigenvalues, and if we have n distinct real eigenvalues, then by this theorem, the n distinct ones, so their eigenvectors are linearly independent, and there's n of them, so they form a basis for Rn. Um, so the eigenbasis, in other words, oh no, you yeah, form a basis for Rn, and that's actually called an eigenbasis. I think I misspoke earlier. I think I had just been confused earlier when I said that when I called um, when I called these an eigenbasis, I think that's not an eigenbasis. That's just a basis for the eigenspace. E one. Okay, and I'm going to leave it there for now.